Sports Radio, 95.9, The Fan. The Fan, your local team live. This is the Knock on Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Knock Reiner. We got a great podcast for you today. We're going to talk a little college football. We're going to talk a little NFL, a little this, a little that. A lot of exciting stuff, as we know. There are a lot of things going on right now. We're about halfway through the seasons of both college and the NFL. So now we're making that final push towards the postseason. Obviously, college having all their bowls and the first four-team college playoff for the national championship and obviously the postseason and eventual Super Bowl in the NFL. Today on the podcast, I will have Alan Slaughterzinski of Fanspeak.com. You can follow him on Twitter, at Zlot Sports. Brings a wealth of knowledge and great numbers to the show. That's why I love bringing him on, talking football, whether it's college or the NFL. All right, fans, let's get to the meat and potatoes of the podcast. Alan Slaughterzinski of Fanspeak.com is here to discuss college football and the NFL. So let's get him on. Alan, how you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on today, Anthony. Not a problem. Uh, let's start it off with college football. Obviously, we I want to get your thoughts on last Saturday night's huge matchup between Florida State and Notre Dame. Kind of get your thoughts on, on that. What, what did you think of that game, and did you think that that penalty flag at the end was a necessary penalty? Yes, it was the right call to make. Uh, you know, look, I was pulling for, for Notre Dame uh, the entire way, I, <laughs> but I thought it was, a, it, it was a call that had to be made, and I thought when you looked back, went back and looked at the replays of it, I thought it was a clear pick and the right call to make. But in all, I thought the game was fantastic. I was really surprised. Uh, you go back a couple of years ago and look at the way that Notre Dame showed up in the national championship game against Alabama, and the fact is, Anthony, that they just did not show up in that national championship game. In this one, this was a completely different Notre Dame team. Uh, it, it, the way that they came out, the way that they hung in there, the way that they played the entire contest. Uh, I think that Notre Dame, of, of, of these one-loss teams to this point in the season, uh, for my money, certainly deserves to be one of the four teams in there. Well, like I said, you know, we'll see. Obviously, the SEC West, they have three out of the top four teams in there right now. Uh, but let me get your thoughts. How do you like this college football season? We're about halfway through it. I mean, what are your thoughts? thoughts halfway through the football season for college? Well, 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 to be honest with you, I was a little concerned with the way it started. Uh, we do a college football podcast, and it seemed like for the first four weeks of the year that there just really wasn't much going on. And then, oops, all of a sudden we had, what was it, six of the top uh, eight teams in the land lose. And, and the next thing you know, everything, the, the apple cart started to get upset, and that's the college football season that I'm used to. According to the swing of it, and of course the SEC – yeah, I mean, the SEC kind of dominates at this point. But obviously, let's get to this week's matchups. You got uh, not a, not like last week and a lot of top you know teams facing each other, but some coaches that might be uh, fighting on the line uh, to keep their job. Speaking of Brady Hoke from Michigan, he plays in-state rival, the Michigan State Spartans. Does he need to win this game against Michigan State to keep a slim chance at keeping his job before the end of the season? Uh, I'd like to say yes, but I don't think there's much shot that Brady Hook has at keeping his job. I think you look at where this Michigan program is, uh, and, and, and certainly uh, you look at the recruiting process, there's not a whole lot coming into Michigan, and of course that falls on the shoulders of the head coach as well. Look, Michigan State I think is favored by 17 points in this contest, Anthony, and I certainly don't see any way, given the way that, that uh, the Wolverines have played this season, that not only will they not win this football game, but I don't think they're going to cover either. And we're talking with Alan Slaughterzinski from Fanspeak.com. You can follow him on Twitter, at Zelot Sports. Wow, that's, that's going to be tough. You know, the Wolverine fans up north, they don't like to hear that, and the ones that we have that are starting to transplant back. Uh, but keeping it in the Big Ten, Ohio State's starting to make some noise. They're in within the top 15. Uh, they play Penn State this week. They have a tough matchup. Penn State's no easy contest. What do you think is going to happen there? Do you think uh, Ohio State keeps things rolling? Yeah, I do. I watched Ohio State play a couple of weeks ago against my Maryland Terrapins. Uh, yeah, I'm from Maryland, so I, I follow uh, – follow the search closely and watched Ohio State come into College Park uh, that weekend is not that big of a favorite but then hang 52 on my turfs. Uh, I think Ohio State's starting to get it together a little bit. It took some time to transition uh, from the you know the uh, the injured quarterback to the quarterback now, and, and, and you're starting to see that play out a little bit better for uh, Ohio State. So, yeah, I, I certainly think that uh, Urban Meyer has that team running in the right direction. 
Now that we've talked about this week, we've got LSU and Ole Miss. But looking ahead to the SEC schedule and just to the coming weeks, we know that the SEC is going to feature top games. Uh, you know, we thought the first half was exciting. The second half is going to be even more exciting. You still got, you know, Ole Miss to play Auburn. You've got Bama and LSU. You still got Mississippi State to take on Alabama. And then you've got the Egg Bowl and the Iron Bowl the same weekend Mississippi State versus Ole Miss and Auburn and Alabama. Between those four teams, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, Auburn, and Alabama, they're currently, you know, they've got a shot to get into this four-team playoff. Which of those three teams do you see not making it or possibly maybe two maybe not making it? You know, if I had to put my money out there, I'd look at the quarterback play that Ole Miss and Mississippi State are getting. Um, and, you know, I love Dak Prescott. He's been responsible for 23 touchdowns through his first six games. Uh, that's one more than Tim Tebow had through uh, six games for Florida in his Heisman Trophy winning year in 2007. And you look at uh, uh, Ole Miss and Bo Wallace, the way he plays in the fourth quarter, he leads all SEC quarterbacks in fourth quarter completion percentage. Uh, Alabama, of course, with Nick Saban, a team that was young this year. And, uh, of course, Auburn, uh, the defending SEC champions. It, it, that's a tough question. But, uh, you know, I guess the, the underdog in me would say I'd love to see uh, the Mississippi teams come out of this. But, obviously, they play each other and they won't. So, I'm going guess, to I guess give away whom I believe. Uh, I'm going to take uh, Alabama over Auburn in the Iron Bowl. And I will take uh, Ole Miss over Mississippi. I like it. I like it. I mean, those are some bold picks right there. I mean, I think it's going to be tough. Like you said, it's not easy. And obviously, we still got a few weeks away before we even get to those games. A lot of things can happen before that. But uh, right now, obviously, like you said, Notre Dame's a one-loss team. They're, they still have a shot to the 14 playoff. What conference do you see or maybe the most surprising team that you think will be left out of this 14 playoff? Wow. Um, <laughs> at, at this point, I think you take a look, I think, the Big 12. Uh, I, I like the way the Big 12 has played this year. Um, but, uh, you know, is it, it could the Pac-12 get left out of this thing? Uh, it would. It's hard to imagine that the Pac-12 would be left out of the national championship picture with four teams now. But I think it could be a real possibility. And we're talking with Alan slaughter from Fanspeak.com. You can follow him on Twitter, at Zelot Sports. I agree with you there. Oregon, you know, losing to Arizona, timely, uh, timely loss there, and I cre- completely agree with you. Oregon, I think the Pac-12 or the Big 12 is one of those teams. They've got TCU, Big 12, and Oregon, so those two conferences need those two teams to do well. Yeah. But uh, moving over to the NFL, I just want to say, uh, I don't know what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers did to the Baltimore Ravens and their fans apparently giving them a gift, but Joe Flacco, did he return anything to Tampa Bay, like a gift or a present after tossing five <laughs> touchdowns in the first half? Yeah, that was something else. Uh, look, I, I have to be honest. Uh, I, I I didn't see it coming at all. I thought the Buccaneers started to really play well. They beat the Steelers the week before or two weeks before that game. In fact, on my podcast, it was my upset pick of the week. I picked the Buccaneers to beat the Ravens that week. Uh, but, wow. Uh, it, it, it's shocking to me, though, that, that a team coached by Lovey Smith in terms of what Lovey brings to the table with his defensive mind to allow something like that to happen. Uh, I, you know, you begin to wonder, is Lovey Smith the right fit there after some of the things that we've seen over there this season? Uh, from that defense, I, I don't know. I, you know, I'd, I'd hate to think that this was a transition year for the Buccaneers and me, but uh, this was a team that a lot of people predicted could be that surprise wild card team, and here they are giving up forty points in the first half in two different games this season. I agree with you, and like I said, I'm just as surprised. I mean, we spent over, I, we spent so much money, and I keep applying to this. We tried the Daniel Snyder model, which has never worked for any team so far, and it's not working out for us. But uh, talking about your Ravens, I mean, you guys have been very oppressive uh, this season. You mean you've only lost to the Colts, and I believe uh, the one, another team is uh, Cincinnati Bengals, who you take on this week. Your Ravens kind of look like they could be a uh, real shot here for the Super Bowl. They look like a real powerhouse in the AFC. Well, we're going to find out a lot about the Baltimore Ravens this week and next week. They take to the road. Uh, they This will be games four and five, or I'm sorry, games three and four out of five on the road in the month of October. Of course, they play the Bengals, as you alluded to, this Sunday and then next week, Pittsburgh. This is going to be, this is going to be tough because, look, Cincinnati's coming off of a white, uh, just getting, getting whitewashed by the Indianapolis Colts. They have looked 
bad ever since they came out of the bye week there against the Patriots. I don't know what happened to the Bengals on the bye week, but it's impressive the way the Ravens have played. And I think what's even more impressive is the way that they've been able to overcome adversity this season. And they're going to have to do it again this week. Uh, John Harbaugh comes out today and announces that uh, tight end Owen Daniels, uh, on the heels of losing Dennis Pitta for the season, Owen Daniels will miss Sunday's game uh, against the Bengals. He had a little knee scope procedure done. So it's going to be tough for the Ravens to get into that offense, that two tight end offensive set that they like to run with that rushing attack without Daniels and especially without Dennis Pitta. I was going to say, you guys have been hit. The Ravens have been hit hard, uh, not even, not inclu- just including last season, but this season at the tight end position. Do you think you have the depth for the tight ends, even if you lose Daniels for multiple games? Well, I, I don't know. They they got uh, the rookie out of Colorado, uh, Crockett Gilmore, involved a little bit more last week. And, of course, they have uh, the sophomore Kyle Juszczyk out of Harvard. So uh, they're going to use those two young guys a lot. Uh, I, I hope nothing happens to them because I'm not sure what, <laughs> if anything, gets behind Juszczyk and Crockett. And we're talking with Alan slaughter from Fanspeak.com. You can follow him on Twitter, at ZLot Sports. It's very true. You never want to lose four tight ends or five tight ends in a season. But yeah. uh, getting your thoughts on last night's game, I thought the Chargers were the team that could uh, you know, really give the Broncos a uh, loss within the division. But uh, obviously I was proven wrong. What do you think about the Broncos? And is there anybody in the uh, AFC that can challenge them? I don't know if there's anybody in the National Football League uh, that can challenge the Denver Broncos at the moment. I mean, they just, not only do the Broncos just go out and win, but they really make it look easy. I mean, you look at the Denver Broncos last night, 27 first downs in this one. Uh, it was amazing to watch them go up and down the football field. Peyton Manning, another uh, a stellar performance. Uh, look, Manning was 7-for-7 seven for, seven for 51 yards and two touchdowns last night when targeting Emmanuel Sanders. What an addition Sanders has been to this team. And you look at Wes Welker, he's the fourth target on this team. Wes Welker is the fourth target in this offense. That's amazing to even think. Uh, and then you look at what they've been able to do with the defensive side of the football, the way they've been able to build that up with DeMarcus Ware. Uh, I, I'm sure the Broncos would like to, if they could, have that Super Bowl rematch with Seattle to happen next week. Because I, I think I'd have to take the Broncos, Anthony. Oh, I agree. And, and you kind of lead into my next subject because let's face it, the Broncos have only lost to one team, and that would be a defending champ, Seattle Seahawks. And the Seahawks are on the slide. And, uh, you know, they traded Percy Harvin last week, and there were a lot of rumblings about uh, some bad blood between Harvin and several players on the team. And Marshawn Lynch was so distraught by the news that Percy Harvin was traded, he didn't even get on the team bus. Can the Seahawks uh, stop the bleeding and stop the sinking ship? Well, it's definitely a, this is definitely a much different team than the one that Pete Carroll took over with the rah rah USC attitude. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, you know, before this all happened with Percy Harvard, I really felt like that the Seattle Seahawks were going through your typical Super Bowl champion, uh, middle of the season doldrums, if you will, because, I mean, there's a reason why a Super Bowl champion hasn't won a playoff game since the New England Patriots did so back in the early 2000s, because these guys come out every year, they've got the X on their back, teams come hard at them every game. Uh, two of the last three Super Bowl champions didn't even make the playoffs in the Ravens, and the Giants. So, you know, you kind of expected something like this to happen with the locker room things. Uh, that can kind of push, uh, you know, uh, this team a little further apart. And then the, the, the thing that was always the uh, the one thing that stood up for this team, of course, was that great defense and that great secondary that they had. And that's the reason, if you look deep inside the numbers, Anthony, the Seahawks are struggling last year. You know, last year I found a fantastic stat. Last year the Seahawks allowed the fewest points, the fewest yards in the league, and they forced the most turnovers. Uh, they were the first team to do that since the 1985 Bears had done so. This season, Anthony, the Seahawks defense ranks 19th in points per game and 9th in yards per game while forcing the fourth fewest turnovers. The other thing I think is interesting is that ESPN does a stat called expected points added. Last year the Seattle defense added 7.2 expected points per game for the entire football team. This year, that defense is costing the Seahawks nearly five points a game. And we're talking with Alan slaughter from Fanspeak.com. You can follow him on Twitter, at Zlot Sports. Going deep for the stats, Alan. Very impressive, man. That's why I love having you on. You're going deep for me. I mean, that you're right, though. I, the Seattle Seahawks, they have... Uh, 
You're right. You know, and that's the other thing I've noticed too is that the defenses that lead teams to Super Bowls, like you know, you talk about the Seahawks and the 2009 Saints, the defenses that you see that you know force the most turnovers. I find it's kind of difficult for them to force those turnovers the next year because teams are kind of looking at that and going, okay, we need to make sure we avoid this. Do you think that's part of the reason that the Seattle Seahawks just aren't getting those defensive opportunities to take the ball away? Yeah, and there's no question. I mean, you could even take it a step further by taking a look at a team like the Pittsburgh Steelers, who do, you know, the Steelers have, a, have had a decent defense the last two seasons. But the reason the Steelers have been mired in 8-8 eight and eight is because that Dick LeBeau-led defense has simply created turn, uh, has simply not created enough turnovers. And during those 8-8 eight and eight seasons, that defense finished in the bottom of the league in that category. Turnovers are the key in any football game. You know, they say win the turnover battle. Well, it, uh, we all know that, Anthony, but forcing those turnovers, how well your defense can do that and how consistently your defense can do that, setting up your offense, especially an offense like what Seattle has where it's more predicated on the run than anything and ball control. If you're not getting those opportunities, then certainly your offense isn't on the field enough. No, you're right there. Like I said, Alan, you, 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 the turnovers are so key, and when you're not getting them, it can lead to the to the uh, stat in the L column, which you don't ever want. But uh, getting away, what are some other matchups this week that you're looking for uh, or that you're excited about this week on the NFL schedule? Well, I'm definitely, of course, excited about that Ravens-Bengals matchup. I'm a little nervous for my Ravens without the two tight ends, as we discussed. I'm looking forward to the Colts steelers matchup. Steelers coming off of a uh, big Monday night victory against the Houston Texans and the Indianapolis Colts. Boy, they really seem to be rolling. They don't look anything like that team that lost to the Broncos. Uh, to start the year, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking to see how well the Cleveland Browns rebound after dropping one to the Jacksonville Jaguars. The good news for Cleveland fans is that they get the 0-6 Oakland Raiders. And, of course, the game I'm really going to have my eye on of 5-1 and one Eagles against the 5-1 and one Cardinals, the battle in the desert. Uh, you're looking at the number one ranked rushing defense in the National Football League in the Arizona Cardinals going up against LaShawn McCoy and that high-flying Kelly offense of the Eagles. So, uh, that's going to be fun to watch. The Eagles are averaging nearly 31 points a game, third in the National Football League. Something's got to give there. You're absolutely right. That game does really intrigue me. Usually I say the Bucks games intrigue me, but because, you know, I've watched two 40-point burgers go on them, eh, it's not as interesting to watch the Bucks anymore. <laughs> but you're right. The Cardinals and the Eagles is really a good matchup. And you know what? It's I can't wait for Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock to get that game rolling. Um, Alan, I just want to ask you the final question before I let you go. What's your thoughts on the MVP race right now? I mean, Andrew Luck's playing really well. Aaron Rodgers is playing really well. The quarterbacks that we expect to play well, even the defending MVP, I think Peyton Manning, he's doing well. But DeMarco Murray sure is making a case. I mean, record seven games in a row for 100 yards rushing. That's my MVP right there, Anthony, is DeMarco Murray. 913 rushing yards. Look, he's got nearly 300 more. Think about that. We're only seven weeks, eight weeks into the season. 300 more than any other player. That's Arian Foster with 615. Uh, my only concern for uh, DeMarco Murray and the Dallas Cowboys is obviously this is a formula that works well for the Dallas Cowboys because you take a look at Tony Romo, and Tony Romo has always been labeled as the guy that can't make the high-pressure throws in the high-pressure situations. Well, because of DeMarco Murray this year, uh, the Dallas Cowboys have been unbelievable, and Tony Romo, I might add, have been unbelievably successful on third down. We all know getting off the field and staying on the field uh, can be as important as, as creating turnovers. Uh, Murray has converted 10 times on 14 third downs this year, and he's allowed Tony Romo because teams have to play against that run. Romo's been 48 of 68. That's 71% on third down this year, but I I think it's all DeMarco Murray there. Love the way this Dallas Cowboy offense is playing. Uh, my only concern going forward is at this current pace, Murray would finish with about 2,100 yards, uh, somewhere about the third, fourth most ever in the National Football League. But he would also be on pace for 427 rushes, and that would break uh, Larry Johnson's record in 2006 of 416. And Anthony, we know that DeMarco Murray has had injury issues, so you hope, you hope that he doesn't break down because I'd be interested to see how he can finish out a campaign like this after the way he started. All right, well, and you mentioned that, and the bonus question is, is how how do you how would you handle DeMarco Murray's carries? Because like you said, that's a lot of carries. Murray isn't exactly the most durable man because he had some injury pass, but you also know the Cowboys want to get to the Super Bowl, so they need him for the playoff push. How would you handle DeMarco Murray's carries at this point? 
Well, I, I think the thing that I would try to do if I was Jason Garrett would be to take it like you're playing the Washington Redskins this week. And look, you know, say what you will about the Washington Redskins, but only the Denver Broncos have an offense and a defense rated in the top ten besides the Washington Redskins. But say what you want about the Redskins. They'll go out there and they'll put up a tough test, but I think the thing that Garrett needs to try to do in these games is establish leads early. That way you can maybe sit on that second string running back a little bit more to protect the football. Maybe you can, you know, you know, the little out planners to Des Bryant, um, uh, work the middle of the field to Jason Witten a little bit more. But I, I think the key to protecting Murray is to try to get leads early in games to, to rest him. I I would agree with that. They've got to find ways to rest them. Alan Slarzinski with Fanspeak.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Zlot Sports. Alan, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast with me once again. You always lay down great knowledge, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, Anthony, anytime, man. Love talking football, NFL or college. All right, Alan, you have a great weekend, and I look forward to having you on the show again. Hey, thanks a lot, man. 